The following recording is a presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Rohnert Park, California, and of Pastor Val Mark Smith. We are an independent Baptist congregation committed to the accurate presentation of the historical doctrines of the faith. We welcome you to visit our services anytime here in the Rohnert Park area. Let's, uh, let's take our Bibles and open them to Exodus chapter 25, and we will resume our study of the tabernacle this afternoon as we look at uh, another one of the finely crafted articles of furniture that was in the holy place. And remember, the holy place is the first of the two compartments in the tabernacle, the second being the holy of holies, and those two are separated by the veil. We have two scripture readings for this message, so if you'll find uh, Exodus 25 and then also Leviticus 24 and hold that place for a few minutes and we'll we'll get to that in just a little while. Now in the last messages we studied the lampstand and we stepped inside the tabernacle to see the beauty of the light from that golden lampstand and looking around the inside the light reflects off the golden boards to see the tapestry of the ceiling. Uh, there's the altar of incense that was just before the veil in the holy of on the in front of the holy of holies and then directly opposite the lampstand on the other wall is the golden table of showbread. As you enter the tabernacle, the golden lampstand would be on your left. That would be on the south wall. Uh, the tabernacle door faced east, and so as you walked in, you were walking westward. South is on your left, and north is on your right, and the table of showbread would be on the north wall. Now, I haven't spoken in these messages very much about the orientation of the tent, but I, I do want to, to make a point of this, that it faced east, and facing east is a significant direction in Scripture. Jesus said that when he returns, he will come from the east. In Matthew 24, verse number 27, he said, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. When the temple was built, it also faced eastward because uh, the Word of God says the glory of God would come from the east. And likewise, the millennial temple will face eastward. Ezekiel wrote in Ezekiel 43, Afterward, he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east. And behold, the glory of God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. Now the gate that it speaks of there is the eastern gate of Jerusalem, which Ezekiel prophesied would be shut until Jesus comes to reign on the earth. In verses 1 through 3 in Ezekiel 44, Then he brought me back the way of the gate to the outward sanctuary, which looketh toward the east, and it was shut. Then said the Lord unto me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it, therefore it shall be shut. It is for the prince, the prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate, and shall go out by the way of the same. Now, the gate that he's speaking of there in Jerusalem was opened uh, when Jesus was here in his first advent. But then interestingly, in AD 1137, the gate was sealed shut, and it remained sealed until this day. Now, I have a picture. Oh, good, you got it up there. We have a picture of the gate as it looks today. Now, that wouldn't be what Jesus saw in his time, because this, this was built uh, 500 years after the time of Christ. But true to the prophecy, this gate is closed. The Muslims, when they overran Jerusalem, wanted to demoralize the Jews by shutting up the gate by which the Messiah would enter into Jerusalem. And of course, both they and the Jews were wrong about the Messiah. Uh, the Muslims can't do anything to keep Jesus from doing exactly what he said that he was going to do. He will come from the east and he will go through that gate. But there's a lot of things that are going to happen between now and then. But this gate will be open when Jesus returns in his glory. Our purpose this afternoon, though, is not to talk about that, not to talk about the second coming of Christ, but we can see how the orientation of the tabernacle and the, 
and, and of the temple speak truths about Christ even extending beyond the first advent to somewhere off in the future with the second coming of Christ. So entering through the door, when the priest pushed that aside, uh, the door of the tabernacle was just another curtain. And when he pushed that aside, he was going in from the east and headed to the west. And before him on the right would be this beautiful table of showbread. Now in Exodus 25 is the command to build it. And then in Leviticus 24, there's the command for placing the bread on it. And so we'll take a look at this. We'll show the picture here while we're reading the scriptures. And we'll look at the command in Exodus 25, starting in verse number 23. Thou shalt also make a table of acacia wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereto a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt make unto it a border of a hand breadth round about. And thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. And thou shalt make for it four rings of gold. And put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof. Over against the border shall the rings be for places of the staves to bear the table. And thou shalt make the staves of acacia wood and overlay them with gold that the table may be borne with them. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, and the spoons thereof, and the covers thereof, and bowls thereof, to cover with all. Of pure gold shalt thou make them. And thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me alway. Now if you go over to Leviticus chapter 24, and verse number, number 5, we have the bread that's placed on the table. Verse number 5. And thou shalt take fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof. Two tenth deals shall be in one cake. And thou shalt set them in two rows, six on a row, upon the pure table before the Lord. And thou shalt put pure frankincense upon each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial, even offering made by fire unto the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place. For it is most holy unto him of the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. Now in keeping with the small size of the tabernacle, remember this is a structure, it's only about 675 square feet in keeping with that small size this this table of showbread was correspondingly small it stood about 27 inches high it was 37 uh, 36 inches long 18 inches wide there were rings that were placed on the legs and through those rings they slipped golden poles so they could lift it and transport it it had two borders an inner and an outer uh, they're about six inches apart and here the scriptures describe them as crowns. The outer border goes around the perimeter of the table, and the inner framed the placement of the bread that was set in two rows of six each. The table is made of gold, overlaid, uh, or wood rather, overlaid with gold. That's similar to the golden boards and the bars and other interior furnishings. And I don't think that we need to go into that symbolism again, because I think you probably got the picture there that it refers to the a dual nature of Christ that he is both God and man and so the materials of construction the wood and the gold tells us that there is an intention in this table to speak to us some other truth that perhaps we haven't yet seen about Jesus Christ of course all these other all the articles have something to say about them as we've demonstrated uh, the brazen altar shows Christ's suffering and death the brazen Labor shows that we are washed from our sins and forgiveness of daily sins. The golden lampstand represents Christ who is the light of the world. And now here is this table of showbread that demonstrates that Christ is the bread of life. Now the table is not an insignificant picture. It, it, it is very significant. No, no doubt in my mind that the crown that goes around the outside of that's around the perimeter speaks to us of the lordship of Christ. So what we could have done, we could have begun this entire series of messages right there, 
talking about the table of showbread. I mean, there is enough in the symbolisms of it to, to keep us occupied for a, for a good while, speaking of the life of the Messiah. But the most significant aspect of the table would, of course, be its connection to food. Whenever we think of tables, usually we think of food. Now, tables are used for other things, of course, but everybody needs food and everybody thinks of food. And so our first thoughts about this table would be about the food that's placed on it. Food is linked to Christ in both the Old and New Testaments. In Psalm 23, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. The table prepared. Isaiah 55, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Now, the scriptures speak of going to Christ for spiritual food. That, that spiritual food is the strength of our soul. Now, in the New Testament, in a scripture that we're going to spend some time with this evening, this afternoon, Jesus says in John 6, 32 and 33, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Christ is the bread that came down from heaven. Now the gold in the table shows that, that Christ is God. That he is God who came down from heaven to give us life. So that's where we're going to spend our time this afternoon. We want to talk some about this symbolism of the bread and what it represents. The purpose of the bread is nourishment. Uh, the bread is about nourishment that comes from God's word. Now, have you got it there? Good. All right. You can see that for your outline. Now, the, this, this Sunday afternoon service is mostly attended by those who are well versed in scripture. Uh, you've heard many sermons, most of you have, that compare physical food to spiritual food. Peter said that the young Christian, the inexperienced, immature Christian, desires the milk of the word. And he said, by the milk of the word, there, in the very beginning, there is spiritual growth. Now, the milk of the word refers to the elementary fundamental principles that are the first grounding of the believer. But as the believer grows, he, he desires more substantive principles. This is called the meat of the word. Hebrews says that meat belongs to those who are of full age. That is, the experienced Christian, the one who's grown through many trials... He's learned enough through the many falls that he's taken that he can apply scripture to discern both good and evil. And it's also for the Christian who isn't satisfied any longer knowing just a little bit about Jesus Christ. And so a mature Christian seeks a deeper knowledge of God's word and through diligent study of the word and teachers that can give him deeper doctrines of the word, then he grows even more. Now, the author of Hebrews complained about this in chapter 5, complained that too many Christians haven't grown. He said they should be in the place where they can teach others. I mean, this is the purpose of you learning the Word of God. So at some point, you become someone who can teach others as well and show them the way of life. So they should be at the place that they teach others. But he said they still need someone to teach them over and over the first principles. They still need meek. Meat because, or milk rather, because they can't handle the meat. Well, the table of showbread represents nourishment that the Christian needs to grow. As we need physical food to sustain physical life, so also we need spiritual food to sustain spiritual life. Now, that spiritual physical food analogy is found throughout the scriptures. In fact, we find in heaven it's the same. In Revelation 2, verse 7, Jesus said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. In heaven, we will eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. Now, in the 22nd chapter of Revelation, John saw heaven, and he saw a clear 
crystal stream that flowed from God's throne. And he said that nourishes the tree of life. Twelve different kinds of fruit grow on the tree of life. And the riverbank is lined with these trees and God's people eat of them. They are, the word of God says, for the healing of the nations. Now, I, I'm not going to speculate on the necessity of that fruit of the tree or the spiritual or how our spiritual bodies will be able to process that food. We won't go into that. But I will say the, the idea that we must have spiritual nourishment for spiritual strength is well documented all the way from the book of Genesis through to Revelation. So here we find God giving Moses instructions concerning this table and the food. And he was told to tell the priest to take bread or bake bread and place that on the table. Leviticus says that there are 12 loaves on the table, two rows of six. And that obviously represents one loaf for each of the 12 tribes. And then the scripture says, and it shall be Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place. So here you have this table of showbread that's not for everyone to eat. Only the priests are permitted. And you may remember that, the, that Jesus confounded the Pharisees on this point about who could eat the showbread when he and the disciples were accused of picking and eating heads of grain on the Sabbath. And what Jesus did was to take them back to the Old Testament to a story about how David and his men were fleeing from Saul and they were famished. And they went into the tabernacle, or went to the tabernacle, to ask for food. And the high priest told him, well, there is no food here. All we have is showbread, and that's for the priest. But the priest had good spiritual insight, and he gave David and his men bread because Jesus taught, or as he taught, that God made no laws that aren't for man's benefit. And so he used that story to teach the Pharisees that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. God gave food to benefit people, to benefit starving people. And those who need food are not to be denied out of a false piety. Now, going back then to the command for the priests to partake of this food, not common Israelites, you see there is a profound spiritual implication. Before Christ came, the priests were representatives of all the people. They were concentrated or consecrated to service and they were to act on behalf of the people. But then when Christ came and when he went to the cross, his death removed all of these restrictive ordinances that were prohibitory and opened up the way for everyone to come to God. Now, in the New Testament, each believer, as we know, is a priest and all of us have the right to partake of all of God's benefits. Now, the Old Testament Israelite, though, he couldn't he couldn't partake. But he did understand this, that he was represented by the priest. By faith, he understood that representation. He understood the ceremonial law. And that taught him that the nourishment that he received from God is a nourishment that is received by faith. See, faith is a principle goes all the way, reaches all the way back into the Old Testament. Our nourishment is received by faith. That is the vehicle that we receive our nourishment simply for this reason. Jesus is not physical food. He's intangible spiritual food. And you receive spiritual food only by faith. Now I'd like you to turn to John chapter 6. And we're going to spend some time in this chapter to see how Jesus illustrated this. Talking about uh, nourishment and speaking of himself as the bread of life. In John 6, 35 is where we'll start. Jesus said unto them... I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now there, Jesus said, he that believeth, or it is the one that has faith in him, who's permitted to partake of him. So all the blessings and benefits that we have in Christ are received through the instrument of faith. And whenever you twist that to make it literal, it destroys the principle of faith. Now, the Jews were certainly literalist. They didn't understand the principles of faith. And so when they chewed on this, no pun intended, they were just bumfuzzled with incredulity that they thought that Jesus was speaking literally of eating him. 
And so interestingly, Jesus took them back to the wilderness, to the tabernacle, to a scene that they would recognize, and he illustrated something that they should have understood. Look at verse number 48. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They were confused. And it only got worse by what he said next. Verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. Now remember, these aren't people of faith. Principles of faith were very confusing to them. So they, they'd long left, since left, the principles of faith that they learned about Abraham. And amazingly, we find the same thing true today, that Christianity, or so-called Christianity, has distorted these scriptures to make the same ridiculous error that the Jews made. Whenever someone mixes grace and faith with works, those are destroyed. Paul said, grace is no more grace. Work is no more work. That's the error of Roman Catholicism that invented the doctrine of transubstantiation based upon this scripture. And so they believe that what you must do is literally eat Christ's body and drink his blood. And so in the celebration of the Mass, they believe that the priest, when he consecrates the elements, they're turned into the literal flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. That is an egregious, blasphemous error on many levels. I don't have time to explore all of that. But most importantly for our discussion, Jesus very clearly said he was speaking spiritually, not physically. Now, he had to explain to the disciples because they were also confused. And so in verse number 60, many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What? And if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words, listen, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. And you read that and, and you have to wonder how... Do you miss Jesus' intent when he said, I'm speaking to you spiritually unless you have an agenda to distort the truth of God's word? And both the Jews and Roman Catholics of the day distort God's word. Both Jews and Roman Catholics have a works agenda. They miss faith. They destroy grace by commingling faith and works. Now, the Old Testament Jews at the tabernacle... They believed that what the priest did was on their behalf. The priest ate the bread. They were the people's representatives. And the story of the showbread concerning David, that just sort of sorts everything out so that we don't get overburdened with the literalism. Now, I, I want to point out also that this is called showbread. That's a kind of a strange name. And we have to ask, what does that mean? What does showbread mean? Well, it literally means bread of face, or this is bread that is set before the face of God. In Numbers 4, verse 7, it's called continual bread. And upon the table of showbread, they shall spread a cloth of blue and put there on the dishes and the spoons and the bowls and covers to cover with all, and the continual bread shall be thereon. Now, there's something to be learned there as well. What, what's the significance of continual bread? Well, we learn from this that the nourishment that we receive is to be regularly ingested. The bread that was placed on this table was replaced each week. When David was given the show bread, it was bread that had been taken off and was replaced with new bread for the new week. 
But that doesn't mean that a priest could only eat of this bread one time each week. And I'm glad it's not that way because surely some lazy Christian would say, now that's a type. You're talking about types here. That's a type. And that means that we only need to be in church once each week. And I would be so impressed by that savvy church member who understands Bible typology so well to come up with that. But sorry to say for couch potato Christians, uh, the priest didn't have to wait to the end of the week to eat. When they were hungry, they would just go get a loaf and then they would replace that loaf. And then at the end of the week, they would replace all of it at once. Now, the type is that nourishment from Christ must be taken regularly. Now, we'll go back to this physical, spiritual food analogy that we have. I look out over you, uh, everyone in here, and um, I don't think there's anybody in here that looks like you only eat once each week. You're going to make it to the table three times a day, sometimes more, and you are flesh, fleshy people. I mean, you look good, you got color because you eat plenty. But sad to say, there's not too many Christians that have good spiritual color. And why don't they? Because they're wasting away trying to get by with just one service each week. And if they miss that service, they're in really bad shape. Now, we're taught the, the same in type with the regularity of manna. Manna in the Old Testament, God sent manna every day. There was always a fresh supply. Israel was told not to gather too much, not to gather more than they could eat on that one day. Whatever they collected on that day must be eaten, all of it. And the teaching was that you need a fresh filling of nourishment, of, of this bread of life, regularly. Now, in John 6, Jesus took their understanding of daily manna and gave it another spiritual application. You remember the miracle that prompted the discussion? The miracle that brought all this to bear is in the beginning of chapter 6, and it's the feeding of the 5,000. Now that miracle was so significant that it's recorded in all the gospel accounts. In fact, it's the only one that is recorded in all the gospel accounts. And after that miracle, the Jews were searching for Jesus as if they would learn something more from him. And Jesus said, no, the only reason that you're looking for me is that you know you can get another free lunch. Now look at verse number 25 in John 6. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Now there do you see again how Jesus substituted the spiritual for the physical? He says, don't labor for food that perishes. That's the physical. Labor for that food that endures to everlasting life. That is the spiritual. Then he goes on in verse number 29 to speak of faith. And then in verse number 31, they bring up manna. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus was a master of spiritual applications. Being the author of the word, he knows all these types perfectly. And he seized on this knowledge they had of daily manna to show that he, he is the true bread from heaven. He must be ingested daily in order to receive proper spiritual nourishment. Now Leviticus 24 verse 8 says about the replenishment of the bread. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. Now, can you see the spiritual application in that? I hope that's not lost on you, because what it's telling us is that we need to be in the house of God regularly to receive spiritual food. I know there are some who say, oh, but I can eat at home. I can just eat all I need at home. I can read my Bible. I can watch a service on TV. You know, my wife's been awfully sick. She misses many church services that pains her deeply because she can't be here. She really wants to come. And I came, uh, came home from church a few weeks ago, and she told me that she had joined Jimmy Swaggart's church. And she said, you know, his church has 38,000 media members. 
Now, some of you would really like to be in that church because you could lay on the couch with a bag of chips and a moon pie and an RC Cola, and you could just sing along with Jimmy. But I promise you, you'd get rotten food if you did. Not anything that's going to help you. That doesn't make for healthy church members. It's like a person who feeds all the time on junk food and then only eats something solid twice a month. That person is going to be shot spiritually. But I know you folks, you're the good crowd. You come on Sunday afternoon because you, you want to gather manna from the Word. You want to eat of Christ. I think in, in this group we have people who do about 95% of church work. Why? Because you're strong. You've grown up. You're nourished. You stayed with this to receive the nourishment of the Word. Jesus must be regularly ingested. So you need a steady diet of Jesus. And that's not just in the church services. You know, I think primarily our lesson here is about church services because the church is given for the growth of God's people. But we ought not to forget that there are days between services. And in those days, you also need to eat regularly. So you need to read the Bible. You need to pray. Those who regularly attend church, I find to be the ones that regularly read, the ones that regularly pray. That's sort of like a package that goes together. To be strong in the Lord takes a daily diet of Jesus Christ. Now let me take you back uh, once more to the physical, spiritual analogy of food. Each of us has a physical appetite. I mean, it'd be very strange if you didn't, didn't get hungry. Everybody has a physical appetite. We have jobs that we go to to work because we want to eat. Paul said, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. So we're in this daily cycle, work to get food, um, eat food to get nourished so we can work some more to get some more food. And the world is in that continual cycle and they're worried about getting enough food so that cycle will continue. Um, in this world of seven billion people, did you know that there are only about one third that don't worry where they're going to get the next meal. The rest of them are always worried. Now, even if, you, even if you don't worry, you think about it, don't you? You think about food. I mean, some of you are, are thinking right now, hurry up, let's get out of here, I've got to get pizza on the way home. I mean, that, that you're, you're, you're hungry or whatever. Uh, everybody, every animal is into food. You know, some of you have pets that you love. Some are cat lovers. What's there to love about a cat? I mean, you, you, you love the cat that he purrs after you because he knows you're the food source. Our dog died about 10 years ago and I miss him not. Um, when I would come home from work or from church, there was the dog always wagging his tail, always wanting a treat. I come home from work and he hears the garage door open and he heads for the door with the tail wagging. And, and what does he want? Is he glad to see me? No. No, he just knows I'm dumb enough to fall for this every time. He, he wants something to eat, and the, and the tail wag's not affection, he wants food. So that cycle goes on and on and on. Physical food, we need that. But physical food only satisfies for a moment. Very soon, you've got to have more. You've got to go back and you've got to eat again. Now, I'm going to leave you with this for this afternoon. Every person has physical hunger. And did you know that God has also made every person to have spiritual hunger? The Bible teaches that every person, whether you're saved or lost, they have an inclination towards God. Now, they don't know how to satisfy their hunger. Often they suppress the hunger. But everybody knows there is a Creator God and we hunger and thirst to know Him. And you see the table that Jesus invites us to is a meal that always satisfies this hunger. This hungering and thirsting after God. The meal that Jesus provides always satisfies that hunger and satisfies it forever. Now we go back to John 6 verse number 33. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. This spiritual food that Jesus gives never spoils. Once you come to Christ, your soul is satisfied. Jesus said in verse 27, don't labor for food that perishes. Labor for food that endures. 
Now we're, while they're concerned about, about this never-ending cycle of physical food, most people are. Jesus said, don't come after me for food, not that kind of food. You're seeking me for the miracle of that food. You want two fish and the loaves, five loaves to satisfy hunger. Well, he says, don't come to me for that. Why? Well, because if you do, you're going to be hungry again. And then you're going to come and seek me again. And then you're going to try to get that food all over again. So he said, just be content with this. To take the spiritual food that I give. And when you take it, you will live forever. I am the bread of life. One meal that you take of Jesus Christ, at least in this sense, satisfies the spiritual hunger forever. Now, I still say that we need to ingest Jesus daily to grow by the word. But as far as our soul's safety is concerned, as far as being satisfied and have the righteousness that we need to meet God in heaven, Jesus is the one who satisfies that spiritual longing and satisfies it forever. The word of God says, taste the Lord and see that he is good. Blessed be God for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to this presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Roner Park, California. If you would like further information about our church, please feel free to call us at area code 707-584-7275 or write to us at Brian Baptist Church, 6298 Country Club Drive, Roner Park, California, 94928. Additionally, you may visit us online at www.bebaptist.org.